The first item of business today is general questions. Question number one, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it considers that its proposals on changes to council tax comply with its treaty obligations under the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. Our reforms to council tax will protect household incomes, enable more support for those on low incomes and provide additional investment in our schools. We have every right to legislate on council tax matters and it remains the case that local authorities will keep every penny of council tax raised. We consider that these reforms will have no impact on our continuing compliance with the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Patrick Harvey. I thank the, the Minister for the answer, but it does seem a little confusing to me. I would draw the Chamber's attention in particular to Article 9, which states that local authorities shall be entitled to adequate financial resources of which they may dispose freely within the framework of their powers, and also that part at least of the financial resources of local authorities shall derive from local taxes and charges uh, of which they have the power to determine the rate. So overall, the Scottish Government's proposal to reintroduce rate capping and to centrally determine how councils will spend any extra revenue gained from the changes to the multiplier do seem clearly to conflict with these objectives. And this at a time when we've seen the, the report on the Commission for Local Taxation Reform arbitrarily dismissed by the government without even a debate in the chamber. Are we really to take seriously that the Scottish Government's proposals comply with the spirit as well as the letter of this charter? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, Presiding Officer, Mr Harvey asked if our proposals were legally compliant, and I have answered yes, they are. They are in keeping with the spirit of the European Charter of Local Self-Government, in that, as I have said, that local authorities will keep every penny of council tax raised. And I look forward uh, to ongoing engagement with local government through COSLA and the others uh, as to the way forward in our budget approach. And I also offer to have further discussions with Mr Harvey uh, on uh, options uh, for the budget ahead. But this parliament and this government has every right to legislate on council tax. If we didn't, why would we be laying regulations to legislate? So we'll take uh, forward the manifesto on which we were elected. Question number two, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government its view on the Trust Trust opening its 50th food bank in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding Officer, it is unacceptable that in 21st century Scotland uh, there are people who cannot afford to feed themselves uh, and their families. And according to emergency food providers, the main drivers of food bank use are benefit delays and sanctions imposed on people by the UK government, as well as unemployment and low income. So we are committed to doing all that we can with the powers we have to lessen the effects of these UK policies and to ensure that everyone in Scotland can access affordable, nutritious food. And we want to eradicate the need for food banks in Scotland and our £1 million per annum fair food fund supports community-based responses that help to reduce reliance on emergency food provision. Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for a reply and with universal credit being rolled out in Inverclyde and within the next couple of months. Does the Cabinet Secretary have any advice for volunteers at my local food bank as they brace themselves for increased requests for assistance due to the UK Government's continued attack on the most vulnerable in our society? Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, the Scottish Government has long uh, made its concerns clear about the, the implementation of uh, universal credit. Um, in practical terms, we already know that the, the built-in delays to the universal credit system can cause long waits for the first payment, which then increases pressure uh, on volunteers at food banks and other uh, community food uh, providers. Uh, claimants uh, can be advised to apply to the DWP for a short-term benefit advance to try and help them tide over, and they can also apply for a crisis grant uh, from the Scottish uh, Welfare Fund. However, there is no doubt that the, the basic problem here is the design of universal credit in the first place uh, and the Scottish Government continues to call on the UK Government to address these before the full uh, rollout of universal credit, before that goes ahead. Question number three, Linda Fabiani. To ask the Scottish Government how it contributes to international development. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. 
As a good, good global citizen, Scotland works to help tackle poverty and inequality, and the Scottish Government has contributed to international development through its International Development Fund, which has supported a range of projects in our priority countries for the past 11 years. The Government has committed to increasing our support for international development from £9 million per annum to £10 million uh, for next year, as well as establishing a new £1 million per annum humanitarian emergencies fund. And this will enable us to do even more to help some of the world's most vulnerable people and continue to respond to the increasing number of international humanitarian crises. Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you to the Cabinet Secretary. And I was also interested to note um, that also through its Climate Justice Fund, um, the Scottish Government is contributing to the UK Government's targets. Um, Cabinet Secretary, the independent newspaper reported a few days ago that official UK figures show that Britain is now the second biggest arms dealer in the world, with most of the weapons fueling deadly conflicts in the Middle East. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it is ironic to, on one hand, fund international development and, on the other, profit from the immorality of the arms trade, the results of which we see every day on our TV screens and in our news bulletins? Will she, on behalf of Scotland, raise this matter with the UK Government? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, in terms of our international development, uh, I think we can agree that some of the real causes of poverty are conflicts across the world, and therefore early resolution of conflicts is an important part of what we can try and achieve. But clearly, so many of these issues, as she points out, are reserved to the UK Government. However, in terms of our peace process uh, support, our support for women particularly, and our programme to support women in resolving conflict situations, and Syrian women in particular, is something that we as a government can do. But she's right to uh, identify some of the issues around the conflict and the differences between uh, arms trade relations and also, at the one hand, also uh, looking at the ODA and the uh, commitment for international development. I think one of the key tenets and principles of our policy set out in man our manifesto was a do no harm approach and we will certainly make sure that in our meetings with Priti Patel and the UK government uh, that we make clear that that is a principle we'd expect them to, to adhere to too. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for indicating that there has been an increase in Scotland's International Development Fund? Uh, this was something that uh, we, the Conservatives, pledged, uh, and I'm delighted to see it's happened. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, are there any further developments proposed for this fund as she goes forward? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm glad to have the support from the Conservatives for international development, and I would say at the start of this new parliamentary term, one of the hallmarks of this Parliament has been the cross-party support for all our work on international development, particularly with our relationship with Malawi, and I hope that would continue going forward. Uh, we are committed to uh, uh, peace and justice at home and abroad, and also to tackling inequalities, and we can showcase by, that what, what, by what we do in terms of our uh, policies at home, but also in internationally and our climate justice fund is world leading um, and in terms of, of adding that to uh, our contribution as Linda Fabiani pointed out that has actually meant from January to December last year we contributed actually 11 million pounds um, and that will be counted as part of the UK government's ODA targets of 0.7 percent. Question number four Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it had made on the creation of the new national parks and what consideration is given to creating one in Galloway? Cabinet um, Secretary Rosanna Cameron. There are no current plans to designate new national parks in Scotland. Uh, the creation of new national parks requires considerable planning, the support of all local authorities in the area, and carries cost implications. And for these reasons, we believe that it is essential to focus support on our two existing national parks to ensure that they continue their valuable contribution to tourism and sustainable rural economic development. Finlay Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response and can I ask if she's aware of the Scottish Campaign for National Parks report, Unfinished Business, produced in conjunction with the Association for the Protection of Rural Scotland, which has identified seven potential areas for consideration as future national parks and which flags up the very considerable economic benefit of national parks in rural areas. If the Scottish Government is serious about rural regeneration, how can it then rule out the possibility of further national parks which do not need to be the same size or scale or with the same regulations as the two current ones? Cabinet Secretary. I don't think anything I said uh, indicated that we were ruling out national parks in the future. What I said is that there are no current plans 
to designate new national parks, and there are very good reasons for that. First of all, I'm not aware of there being any specific proposals before us from uh, local communities uh, in respect of the creation of national parks. Of course, I'm aware uh, of the broader studies that are being done. Um, however, I think the, uh, uh, the, the member should perhaps also be aware uh, that when this parliament, through the petitions committee uh, in 2015, uh, looked closely at this, uh, they ultimately concluded that there was insufficient support and a lack of consensus among stakeholders. And that consensus is absolutely essential if national parks are to work. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary agree that there is a need for us to look again at how we can promote the southwest of Scotland as a visitor destination, particularly for wildlife and green tourism, including options for future landscape destinations? designations and that an assessment of the potential costs and benefits of any proposal would need to be undertaken. Cabinet Secretary. Well indeed and I, I would endorse the latter part of uh, Emma Harper's uh, uh, question uh, there. Um, of course the South West does already host a number of uh, designated areas. There's a Galloway Forest Park which is a long-standing uh, uh, um, uh, park. Uh, there's a the Galloway Biosphere, which interestingly enough I gave the go-ahead to uh, when I was previously Minister for the Environment. Um, the National Scenic Areas uh, uh, also uh, in the South West. Um, there are other options. People have pursued options of regional parks. Uh, there's a geopark, uh, I think, which is being uh, looked at in the South West as, as well. So um, there are a number of options for designations. Each of them require uh, different things to bring them into being. And I would encourage all communities to consider that variety of options and consider which might be most appropriate for their areas. Question number five, Richard Leonard. Um, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will take action to prevent NHS Lanarkshire from closing trauma and inpatient orthopaedic services at Monklands Hospital. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. NHS Lanarkshire, as supported by the Academy of Royal Colleges and uh, Faculties in Scotland, has been clear that the interim changes are necessary in order to ensure the safety, quality and resilience of local services. I've been assured that the interim plans will not materially impact on the provision of a &E services at any of the three main hospitals in Lanarkshire. The A&E department at Monkland sees around 66,000 patients per year and the board are estimating that 98% of patients will be unaffected by the interim changes. That means the number of individuals who will be treated at either Hairmeyers or Wish or General as a result of the interim changes should amount to three to four patient referrals each day. I do expect the, board, the Health Board to keep the actual activity information under close review. Also, the Health Board has given uh, assurances that it is committed to retaining three district general hospitals with a &E departments as part of their longer term plans, which are now subject to public consultation. And I would encourage all stakeholders, including the member, to play a full part in that consultation. Richard Leonard. Uh, presiding officer, it's customary to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer, but I'm in this Parliament in a representative capacity and the people of Lanarkshire will not thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. People rightly expect genuine consultation before decisions that affect them are taken. The one section of this document which the, shadow, which the Cabinet Secretary referred to, achieving excellence, upon which there is no public consultation, is the withdrawal of trauma and inpatient orthopaedic services from the Monklands next month. This goes to the very heart of how our democracy works. Will the Cabinet Secretary call this in, yes or no? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I've said, NHS Lanarkshire's interim plans are about ensuring clinical safety and the quality of care as supported by clinical experts at the Academy of Royal Colleges and Faculties. Um, it will help to address the issues that I'm sure the local member is aware of around recruitment, retention and the training of key clinical staff. Um, but also, as I said in my initial answer, the longer term service plans are currently the subject of formal public consultation, which will run until the 1st of November. I would point out, however, to the member, of course, that it was this government that saved the A&E department at Monklands from closure in 2007. Since then, we've seen over half a million attendances at that department, half a million people that would not have been able to attend that hospital if the member's party had had its way back in 2007. So I'm sure local people will remember the reality of that. Fulton McGregor. Thank you. Will the Minister confirm for the clarification, if any doubt, today 
that the guarantee given by this party 10 years ago, when the Labour Party voted to close down the Monklands a &E, still stands, and as long as there is an SNP government, there will be accident emergency services at Monklands. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, absolutely. I, I can guarantee that there will be any departments at all three hospitals within uh, Lanarkshire. But also to also reassure the member that there has been a significant investment into Monklands Hospital over recent years, including a new theatre, critical care unit upgrade, a new uh, pathology, pathology laboratory, and of course the 22 million Lanarkshire Beats and Radiotherapy Centre, and of course this planned, further planned investment, including improved facilities facilities for day surgery, an immediate assessment unit adjacent to the A&E department and of course a single centre of excellence for cancer services in Lanarkshire which will be consolidated at the hospital. Plus I'm sure the member will be aware that we have welcomed NHS Lanarkshire's preparation of a business case either for the redevelopment of the hospital or for a new build replacement. I think that shows that this government is absolutely committed to the future of Monklands Hospital. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary may not be aware that her party colleague Alex Neil, uh, this week in his local paper, was promising the people of Lanarkshire that uh, the trauma and inpatient orthopaedic services at Monklands would not be closed under the SNP. Has she given him that assurance? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm happy to meet with Alec Neil or any other local members to discuss any of their issues uh, around this development. But what I can say is this, NHS Lanarkshire have been very clear about the reasons for these interim plans. They are about clinical safety and the quality of care. We cannot ignore the, um, the expertise and the uh, concerns raised by the Academy of Royal Colleges and Faculties. What is clear, however, as I have said in all my answers here today, is that NHS Lanarkshire and this government remain absolutely committed to having three a &E departments within Lanarkshire. The configuration of those and the way those uh, departments work together to the final aim of a single trauma site and a single elective site is very, very important. This is about sustainable, safe services, and I am sure that all local members will want to support that aim. Ali Neil. Thank you, Presenting Officer. Can I, uh, can I, first of all, just for the record, point out that the Labour leader of North Lanarkshire Council, Jim Logue, has given unqualified support to the proposal by NHS Lanarkshire to transfer trauma and orthopaedic to the other two hospitals. Uh, not for the first time the Labour Party speaks with more than one voice when it suits them. Uh, secondly, uh, as Mr Simpson is a former Sun reporter, let me just be accurate what I did say. And I hope uh, it's not a third and can I ask, Mr And can Neil. I ask the Cabinet Secretary, and the point I'm making is this, that when we come to the uh, designation of a permanent orthopaedic site, that the new Monklands Hospital planned by this Scottish Government for 2023 would be a logical place to put the single orthopaedic elective centre. Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Alec Neil for his question and putting on the record the very, the very interesting views of Jim Logue. Uh, can I say that I think there would be a very strong case for the single elective site for orthopaedics to be at the new or refurbed Monklands Hospital. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done uh, in the lead up to that decision. That is why it is open to consultation at the moment. But I'm sure Alec Neil and all of the other local members will want to input into that consultation and make their views known about where that site should go very strongly to the board. Okay, question number six, Gail Ross. Thank you, President Officer. At this time, I would like to inform the Chamber that I have been appointed as PLO to the First Minister. To ask the Scottish Government what support it gives to Highland Games. Minister Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government is committed to protecting the Highland Games as a tradition enjoyed by many communities across Scotland. Our National Agency for Sport, Sport Scotland, also shares this commitment and recognises the Scottish Highland Games Association as the governing body of traditional Highland Games in Scotland. Gail Ross. I thank the Minister for her response. During recess, I attended a number of games and gatherings in my constituency. At present, there are concerns from some that putting on games, especially smaller ones that rely on volunteers, is difficult given the amount of bureaucracy associated with it. 
Is there any way that the Scottish Government can help lessen the amount of bureaucracy associated with Highland Games or any support that they can offer to organisers to make the process easier? Minister. Uh, I am happy to meet with uh, Gail to discuss this issue and look at the specifics and details of what she is uh, describing. And I know that this is an issue that Gail Ross has been working hard on along with local games in her constituency. Games do rely heavily on pools of dedicated volunteers and we are all appreciative of that commitment and their work to keep this proud tradition alive. So in addition to meeting with uh, the member, I, I will also task my officials to discuss the issues that she has raised with the Scottish Highland Games Association. Thank you.